Juning les, ne les a pas suivis jusqu'ici, mais Aurénia demeure préoccupée. Longtemps, elle scrute l'horizon en espérant recevoir un signe de la que la grande baleine a entendu leur appel. En vain, il n'y a que ce pauvre Garuda qui, vo qui vogue au loin. Son glacier encore rétréci. Orimia sent une grande fatigue envahir son corps et son cœur. « Dors, je resterai près de toi, » lui chuchote Utia. Étendue près de la mer, la brise du nord caressant ses joues, elle se laisse gagner par le sommeil. Orimia rêve. Comme toujours, elle plonge au fond de l'océan. Elle va rejoindre la grande baleine endormie, celle dont le dos est attaché à la croûte terrestre. Mais cette fois-ci, quelque chose a changé. La baleine l'attend. Elle est libre et bien réveillée. Et Orenia connaît enfin son nom, Nioma. Orenia rêve toujours. Elle flotte maintenant au-dessus d'une vaste forêt de pins déformés par les ondulations aussi impressionnantes qu'étranges. Le mouvement des arbres ressemble à la respiration d'un être vivant. La petite rouquine se rend compte qu'elle se trouve sur le dos d'un cerf forêt. La titanesque bête verte lui présente ses bois. Deux troncs géants et noueux qui poussent sur sa tête. Aurémia s'y agrippe fermement et constate qu'elle se trouve au milieu de l'océan Pacifique en se hissant sur de interminables pattes. Le cerf forêt fait danser des millions de morceaux de plastique à la surface de l'eau de vases étendus multicolores qui entourent ses pieds. I always been a wild child, a dream chaser, a poet. And thanks to my father who brought me in epic walks in the forest telling me stories that involve all my five senses and invoked all the physical elements of nature. He taught me the craft and love of visual thinking and of music and its impact on the human mind. Thanks to my mom, who would bring me outside and play in the rain and our magical carved wooden box containing tarot cards that ignited my imagination. I learned really young to create board games, choose your own adventure books, books and music. And I feel I was free to talk to the trees and the stars. I always felt that the wind had a message for me and I was free to do so and think it was real. My parents let me live that wild child fantasy. I feel I was born to tell highly contagious stories, to awake dormant imagination in humans. I feel I was put on Earth to make you all remember that's why it's so great to live on Earth right now. But why does this matter to me and maybe to some of you? When I became a father myself, my first child, Alice, had asthma for three years. Every month, I was in the emergency room with her. In that very captive environment, I was vulnerable, and I didn't apply a very disciplined approach to interactive stream. I tried to cope with lack of sleep and new ideas to entertain a sick kid. And you know, a, a sick kid is always more healthy than, a, than an adult. So uh, I lost control a little bit, and I'd, like Alice became addicted to, to her iPad. I thought that my expertise in multi-platform storytelling would have helped me avoid this situation. But it was such that Alice had to be on program. I had to completely relearn how, what is the role of technology in a kid's world, and I needed to teach her how to control her urges. Obviously, this had a profound impact on my work, but it's al it also triggered a very painful memory. 16 years ago, I was working 100 hours a week, and I had a late night call. I worked in networking and hosting company. There was a network crash. I arrived there, red light blinking, thousands of them, 
roaring of the ventilation system. <laughs> Very evil. And I could not even fathom the fact that if there was a fire in that room, there would be no hair. There was a mechanism to remove hair. It was anti-human. I wasn't that forest of server, but seriously, all I wanted to be was in a forest of trees at this moment. That very night, after the nervous breakdown, I wanted to be obsessed with humans. I was no longer obsessed with computers at all. I felt that all the poetry that my parents gave me just came back and says, like, you're a poet. You're not a network specialist. So that freak out led me to realize I needed to inject poetry and empathy in the system surrounding me to make this ubiquitous computing era that was arriving more human. So, as an engineer, uh, experienced designer, and interactive storytelling artist, I was always curious of about what was the best way to excite all senses during a storytelling experience. I needed to understand how body map worked. What is a body map? Let me explain. In our brain, our brain maps every sense and organ. They all have a specific region in our brain. They are our primary contacts with the external physical world and with our inner psychic world. These maps grow over time as we evolve. Some of these maps are extremely big, like the ANDS map, 50% bigger than all the other organs maps. Children, for example, learn the world by their hands for eight years until they learn structured language. And their body maps evolve over time based on the diversity of their physical experience. The first discovery I made on the rehab of my kid was that to develop a curiosity for new knowledge, you needed to have simultaneous sensory experience that involved all senses. But Alice was addicted. She was addicted to her screen and she was in a distraction loop. And this distraction loop was created by persuasion designer like me. Those people use dark patterns technique to lure people into staring at their screen until they zone out. It's, it's kind of the business model. So no time limit, no sane usage recommendation. In-app purchase schemes abound in the kids' atmosphere. It's made to have the kid click and add more buttons, more people, more cows, more pigs. But it's infinite, and there's no time limit. So they really go over time. My first point about this is that the second discovery that came to me was that the inner dialogue that we develop when we tell story is linked to tactile interaction and reading. And this very experience of reading on paper always was a very important thing to me. The reflexivity induced by paper, the ends left and right moving, might as well have an impact on how the brain interprets things. The inner dialogue is also affected by how light interacts with your eyes. When you read a, a book, your consciousness is projected on paper. When you read an iPad or a tablet, the light is projected in your retina. It's very two different cognitive experience. And also, there's a magical link, I think, maybe some of you think, between ends and memory. Remember, body maps. So my third discovery came a little later. And it, it was about this new era that we are entering. I realized that the kid should not be brought to technology for any other reason than discovering the world around them. It should not be to hide from the world or to block them to go outside. There should be not a device or a technology that impeach them to appreciate nature. So for me to bring technology to, to, to the kid would be to help them discover the missing connection around them. And we no longer live in an information age. We live in a sensor age now. Everything will be connected. And the kids, by knowing it or not, they are already living in that world. But they don't see it. It's invisible. But it's there. And technology should allow them to see those new connections that are coming to us. And it should also help them create new ones, not of the same. But to do this, we're going to need to love nature. And we cannot love nature or appreciate nature if we are distracted. So how are we going to do this? 
My fourth discovery is that we need to fight an attention before we try attempting anything else, create any new experience. We need to know and learn how to center our attention. So this attention problem led me to a, a question, and it was a question about whether or not I was able to interconnect all those things. The fighting attention problem had two folds. One was the transhumanist agenda. What is a transhumanist agenda? It's the agenda, the industrial agenda we all live in that promotes a kind of homogeneous and predictable way of using device. One device for all, everybody on their screen, and it's down interaction. You know, We don't look at each other in the eyes most of the time now. But of course, there's an equilibrium to find. So this transhumanist agenda, they are using algorithms to find ways to predict our behaviors. We need to understand those algorithms, but we also need to bypass them. I think te technology should have a purpose. It should have a built-in mechanism to build appreciation for nature, to cut off technology, like technology that to ask you, like, you know, you've been using me too for too long, I'm just gonna cut off for 24 hours because you're, you're stupid. <laughs> or, or maybe it should like allow you to have an epic walk. You know, you should go walk. So I will not walk, I will not work if you're not walking. So you need to walk straight for an hour if you want me to read the story. So I had to create this inventive new form of storytelling involving epic walks, forced epic walks, stand up and walk, otherwise I'm not working. Uh, forced rhythms, rune casting, weird tarot readings for kids, you know, uh, magical uh, games with ends involving symbol and very complex literature. That actually, when we tried this with parents, they were like, my kid will not be able to read that. And actually, we're wrong. Every kid is able to read, even dyslexic ones, when the outcome is a film. So that led me to another case where my quest to interconnect those pieces led me to a discovery, a kind of fifth discovery. Before I talk about this fifth discovery, what you saw was Alexi reading a book was actually done in a class. We did that with 30 kids just before Christmas, 23rd, 23rd of December. The kids are super excited, and then there's a book coming. Oh, we're going to really read a book. And then the film starts. Every kid stops. There's music. The music changed the tonality of the reader. So, l'interconnectivité qu'on a découvert a fait en sorte que les enfants n'ont pas eu l'impression d'avoir un exercice de lecture. Ils avaient l'impression de faire partie d'un film. La lecture les a fait focuser pendant 40 minutes, des enfants de 8 à 12 ans. La professeure, elle n'avait jamais vu une classe aussi attentive pendant si longtemps sans avoir à faire aucune discipline. Les enfants, tour de rôle, se passaient le livre, pensaient aux enfants dans la classe qui avaient de la misère à lire et leur laissaient les phrases plus faciles. Il y avait une forme de participation qui s'est installée un, un peu euh, au hasard. Et à, à la fin du 40 minutes, les enfants avaient lu entièrement un livre assez complexe pour leur âge et avaient généré un film. Donc, cet après-midi, on a eu la chance d'avoir la visite de Vincent dans la classe pour euh, expérimenter euh, l'univers du euh, renard boursia. Euh, précédemment, avec les élèves, on avait entendu un petit peu parler de l'histoire, mais là, cet après-midi, on a vraiment pu expérimenter euh, la lecture du livre. Donc, les élèves à tour de rôle euh, lisaient l'histoire et avec le iPad, la reconnaissance vocale animée, le tableau, donc avec euh, du son, de la musique, des images et tout ça. Euh, sincèrement, j'ai jamais eu une classe aussi attentive qu'aujourd'hui. Pourtant, on est la veille de Noël, il y avait de la frénésie dans l'école tout plein, mais les élèves étaient attentifs, ils regardaient ce qui se passait, euh, il y avait les, les regards curieux, ils étaient animés. Ça a été vraiment un très, très beau moment en classe cet après-midi. Donc, euh, Wuxia, d'un point de vue euh, pédagogique, dans une classe, c'est une petite merveille. Euh, assurément, là, pour euh, donner le goût de la lecture, ou conserver le goût de la lecture là, chez les jeunes, euh, l'histoire est captivante, le vocabulaire est recherché. Aussi, ça donne la chance à l'élève de lire à voix haute. Dans ce cas-ci, c'est une expérience interactive, donc il y a un but. En plus de lire à voix haute, il y a la stimulation de voir l'application s'animer. Il y a une élève là, cet après-midi qui était un peu gênée, un peu timide en classe. Habituellement, elle ne veut pas trop lire parce qu'elle a des difficultés en lecture. Puis là, oups, elle a levé la main, elle est allée lire. Elle a même été très fière d'elle de voir que l'application pouvait reconnaître sa lecture. 
petite dans son visage, là, ça valait tout l'heure du monde de voir que cette petite fille-là, elle avait vraiment eu le plaisir de lire. C'était pas un fardeau, c'était vraiment de la plus souvent. Cette expérience-là nous a amené à une cinquième découverte. Cette cinquième découverte-là, c'était le fait que quand on lit à voix haute, on ancre les gens dans le présent. Et la voix, la, la voix elle n'est pas utilisée tant que ça aujourd'hui. On pourrait l'utiliser plus. Donc, c'était un des points forts qu'on voulait faire, c'est que l'ancrage dans le présent, « The spoken voice is what puts you in the present moment. This is what grounds you. This is what gives other people an emotional resonance to what you're living inside. This is what triggers the inner dialogue in every one of us. If you don't hear me talking, you're not talking inside your head. But now you do. All of you. Either this guy is crazy or this guy is, this guy is interesting. But then it goes further, because I'm affecting the emotion you put on the words I have. So this fifth discovery led me to a very important statement. When I developed my technology, I wanted to have a simultaneous sensory experience. Not just touch, not just hearing, not just feeling. All my organs should be involved in different parts of my brain. I'm very grateful for my parents that taught me the importance of mixing multiple senses during a storytelling experience. And today, Alice is five, and she has been learning to control technology. Lately, she told me, Dad, it's no longer time for screen. It's time to play now. Thank you. <laughs>